Hello, welcome back. Uh, I'm Blake Tuchet for the National Center for Science Education. Uh, and in this video, we're going to continue our discussion of resolving misconceptions with students in the classroom. Okay, in our last video, uh, we had introduced everyone to this cognitive reconstruction of knowledge model by Dool and Sinatra. Uh, and we had talked about the first part of understanding and resolving student misconceptions which was looking at existing conceptions uh, that the learner might be bringing into the classroom. Uh, so we had talked about how to evaluate the strength, coherence, and commitment of a, a student's misconception, as well as looking at what it actually takes from the teacher um, to resolve those misconceptions. So teachers need a high level of content knowledge, as well as uh, a high understanding of student misconceptions, how to identify them, and how to approach them. Um, we had also talked about different types of misconceptions or categories of misconceptions that students can be coming into the classroom with, um, and which one of those are weak and which one of those are strong. Um, so we said that Misconceptions are complex. Uh, there can be lots of different reasons for a student having misconceptions and bringing them in um, and different ways to approach them. Some just take clarification uh, and allowing students to dig into the evidence surrounding uh, a scientific concept, while others are going to take a, a deeper, more delicate approach uh, with you know, deep understanding on the student's part of the nature of science how the process of science works, um, how to evaluate evidence, um, as well as building good trusting relationships with students so that they are even uh, willing to listen to and process uh, the message that teachers are giving to them. Um, so the next parts of these of this knowledge model uh, are going to be looking at, at the rest of you know, the interactions between the teacher and the students and the curriculum. Uh, so the thing that we're going to go to next is uh, we're still going to be looking at the student um, for a second. Um, but the next part of this, this big puzzle is motivation. Um, so there's plenty of research that shows that in order for anyone to resolve a misconception, they have to be motivated to do so. Uh, so there has to be something that's motivating that person um, to resolve the misconception that they're holding and then move to a more solid understanding of how that scientific concept actually works. Uh, and there are four characteristics associated with motivation for changing. Uh, the first is dissatisfaction. Um, so a person or a student must experience some dissatisfaction with the idea that they are currently holding before they will accept another explanation for that idea. Um, so in the classroom, this means that students have to experience cognitive conflict um, between what they believe or what they think they understand and what the reality is uh, of the scientific consensus. So this can happen by showing student anomalies or contradictions between their existing conception and new data that's presented along the lines of that scientific concept. Um, the second characteristic is personal relevance. Um, so a student is going to have no motivation for resolving uh, a misconception if the new ideas or concepts presented to them aren't personally relevant. Um, so students have to have a stake in the outcome, uh, they have to be interested in the topic, uh, or they have to have some type of emotional involvement with the new concept as it's being presented to them. Um, the next uh, characteristic associated with motivation is social context. So we have to understand as teachers um, that no learning happens in isolation. Uh, so all learning happens in the context of, of something else. Um, so in the context of the classroom, in the context of their larger community, in the context of the, the national political climate, uh, or, or what have you. Um, so teachers can actually leverage this social context uh, to help them resolve misconceptions with students. So if members of a student's peer group community group, family group, 
uh, can motivate them to process information uh, that they normally would not have, teachers can use that um, to, to help students engage with listening to the new evidence being presented um, and with processing that information. So, you know, if we have a, a group of students that's really engaged in learning uh, a particular concept, they might be able to apply some peer pressure in a positive way uh, to get a more hesitant student who holds a misconception to also engage with that. Um, additionally, um, we could bring in uh, community members uh, or family members to help in that motivation process. So this could be as simple as, you know, getting the teacher down the hall engaged in the conversation, an administrator on campus, a coach, um, you know, a club sponsor, uh, or it could be as simple as, you know, making a phone call home to family uh, and explaining, here's the topic that we are going to be discussing in class. Um, I know that your student may be hesitant, uh, but we would love for them to engage with the evidence that we're presenting and come to a conclusion about this topic. Um, the last characteristic involved with motivation is a need for cognition. Um, so can we make the students have an intrinsic motivation to want or need to know what the reality of this concept is. Um, so can we get students to engage with the ideas, um, information, concepts, uh, and can we make them feel like they should be challenging um, themselves and their, their current understanding of the topic? Um, can we get them to engage with different sides of an issue uh, and kind of open their, their mind to the possibility of uh, the correct understanding. Um, so there are lots of different ways that we can kind of get students motivated uh, at, at these different levels. Um, and this comes between the interaction uh, between the students and the, and the message, which is the curriculum that the teacher is using and how the student is engaging with that curriculum. So you can see that red arrow kind of shows the engagement between the student and whatever it is they're learning and how they're learning it. Um, so some really great things that can help kind of get that motivation kicked into high gear for students um, is teaching students uh, about how different topics can be messaged outside of the classroom. Um, so teaching students about the characteristics of science denial and logical fallacies that are commonly used in the media. Um, so we have a tool for this that's called FLIP. Um, so we teach students about how rhetoric can be manipulated in different ways um, by different groups who are trying to get you to believe a certain thing. Um, so we can teach the students about fake experts, different types of logical fallacies, uh, impossible expectations like moving goalposts and never having enough evidence to satisfy an argument, uh, teach them about cherry picking data, um, teach them about, you know, conspiratorial thinking. Um, so by teaching how these uh, different processes work, we can make students aware of ways in which they might have thinking that falls along these lines or has been influenced by people using these tactics. Um, so not only will they, they be able to evaluate their own understanding and if they have been tricked by one of these tactics, but they'll also be able to spot it so that in the future, uh, they won't pick up any misconceptions uh, that may have been presented to them using one of these characteristics. Uh, another technique um, that's very useful is teaching students how to evaluate sources for validity and reliability. Um, so again, we have uh, at the National Center for Science Education, uh, we have tools for um, evaluating sources that we use. One of them is the CRAP test, uh, where students look at sources uh, for currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. Um, so how old is this information? Um, who is presenting this information and they are they actually qualified to be giving this information out to people? Um, what are their backgrounds? What are their qualifications? 
Um, they can do some lateral reading to determine how accurate uh, that information is being presented. Um, so lateral reading means, you know, opening up multiple tabs, uh, checking for the accuracy with another source, uh, seeing if the information that's presented to them actually has um, citations or sources um, or is grounded in evidence and research. And then the purpose, you know, what is this person trying to convince me to do by presenting this information? Are they just giving me information? Are they trying to sell me something? Are they trying to make me vote a certain way uh, or believe something for their benefit? Um, so by using tools such as this crap test or, um, you know, the, the baloney test from Carl Sagan uh, or some other um, version of this, students can really learn how to evaluate new information that's coming in so that they won't pick up additional misconceptions in the future. Um, we also have a tool called Fable, which specifically is designed for um, teaching students how to evaluate social media sources, um, thinking before they share things, exerting self-control, um, again, reflecting on whether this information might be biased. Um, so by teaching students the characteristics of science denial, logical fallacies, how to evaluate sources for validity and reliability, um, this can kind of kickstart that internal motivation for doing some self-reflection. Do I think any of these things because someone has tricked me? Um, and it will also keep them on the lookout uh, so that they don't pick up any additional misconceptions in the future. Um, so these are some tools that teachers can embed anywhere into any curriculum unit um, to try and get students engaged and motivated uh, to, to really want to know what is it that I understand and does that really fit with the scientific evidence that is presented. Um, so the next big piece of this puzzle is the message. Um, so for teachers, the message is really two things. Um, what is the curriculum, the materials, the resources that I'm using to try and teach this concept? Uh, and secondly, how am I delivering it? Um, so it's both curriculum and instruction that's involved with the messaging. Uh, and research shows that there are four elements of an effective message or an effective curriculum. Uh, first of all, the message needs to be comprehensible, uh, which means that whatever curriculum a teacher is using has to be developmentally appropriate for the student. Um, so this means that the teacher must know the student's background, um, they need to know where the student is, uh, and they need to make sure that the curriculum that they're using um, is appropriate and at the appropriate level for the student. So if they don't have enough background, um, the teacher may need to provide some extra scaffolding. Uh, if, on the other hand, if the curriculum is below the student's level, um, then they may have to provide some, some enrichment uh, for the student to engage with it. Um, the second aspect of the message is coherence. Um, so is the curriculum coherent? Does it follow a logical learning progression um, so that the story can flow in the student's mind and make sense? Um, so if a curriculum is fragmented or it jumps around um, from one disparate fact to another disparate fact, um, students aren't as able to engage with it. Um, and the curriculum must also be coherent in the larger aspect as well. Um, so not only do we need a good flow for the concept we're learning now, but teachers also need to demonstrate to students how does what we're learning now connect to everything else in this content. Um, the third aspect of uh, an effective message is that it has to be plausible. Uh, and for a message to be plausible and credible to a student, the student has to have the opportunity to engage with authentic evidence to determine for themselves whether that evidence is enough uh, to be uh, believed. Um, so students have to have the opportunity to weigh the quality of evidence presented to them and decide for themselves how truthful they think it is. Um, so anytime we can get students engaging with evidence um, and 
authentic evidence. Um, so looking at actual studies, um, doing simulations that are modeled off of real world scenarios um, that just makes the content more plausible for the student and makes them more willing uh, to accept it and engage with it. The last characteristic of the message that's important is that the message has to be rhetorically compelling. Um, so the language that the teacher and the curriculum materials are using, uh, the sources that the teacher is citing or that the curriculum uh, is citing, and the justifications that the teacher or curriculum is giving have to be convincing and persuasive to the, the student. Um, so again, this kind of goes back to um, what we talked about in the last video, um, using brave classroom practices to make sure that you're, you're speaking in a way that's going to be positively received by the student. Um, so engaging with them where they are, finding out what their interests are, what their concerns are, um, and presenting the curriculum and, and the evidence and the arguments in a way that's going to be receptive, uh, received by the student in, in a good way. Um, so one of the things that NCSE uh, uses uh, and, and a lot of other curriculum uh, developers um, that are making materials that are aligned to the next generation science standards is a coherent flow graphic. Um, so we use what are called storylines to build out our units. And this is just phenomenon-based inquiry-driven learning. Um, so I know that, again, this might look a little complex, uh, but basically we are starting and ending with the standards. So what are the standards that we want the students to master in this unit of instruction? Um, we're going to use backwards design to have those standards as our beginning and ending points. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is lay out the content. So what are the, the core ideas of content that we want students to learn in this unit? We will lay those out in a logical progression that makes sense for the students. Um, and then we're going to look at, okay, now that we know what content we want them to learn, how do we want them engaging in this content? So what are the science and engineering practices that we want students doing while they're learning this information? Do we want them to be making and critiquing models? Do we want them to be arguing with evidence? Do we want them to be asking questions and designing investigations to learn about this content? Um, and cross-cutting concepts. Um, so how do we want them to make connections between what they're learning now and the bigger picture in science? Um, once we have those laid out, um, we will choose phenomena. So what are some things that would be interesting for students to investigate so that they can learn about these ideas and practice uh, these you know, scientific practices? Um, and then once we have our phenomena chosen and we know what we want them to learn and how we want them to learn it, uh, the last thing to do is just select learning activities that will allow them to move through those storylines and do these science practices to learn these ideas uh, and then providing assessments to make sure um, that they are fully understanding the concepts, uh, resolving misconceptions along the way, um, and not picking up any new misconceptions inadvertently. Um, so using a storylining approach or a phenomenon-based inquiry-driven approach um, really provides the coherence and the motivation um, that we want when we're when we're delivering the message. Um, and again, there's lots of research dating back to over 20 years um, that shows that, you know, if phenomenon-based inquiry instruction is done correctly, um, it can increase student outcomes. Um, so it increases resiliency, perseverance, creativity, retention of concepts because they're incorporating this story into their, their logic models. Um, it can increase their proficiency with the science practices, uh, increase their communication skills, increase their enjoyment and engagement, uh, and even increase outcomes on standardized tests and success in college courses. Um, and we also have studies that show that taking a storylining approach, a phenomenon-based approach, uh, can decrease those performance gaps that we see 
um, when we're looking at gender, SES, and racial gaps in students, and it can reduce boredom and burnout. Um, so there are lots of, um, there's lots of evidence that show that uh, presenting a clear, concise, um, compelling message in a coherent way that makes sense for the students has a lot of benefits. Um, so the next part of this logic model is what's called the engagement continuum. Um, and Dole and Sinatra uh, actually state that this is possibly the most important part of this entire process. Um, so the engagement continuum refers to um, how hands-on and minds-on are the students in this messaging. Um, so are they thinking deeply about it as it's presented to them? Um, and what we know is that uh, high engagement is going to contain or is, is going to involve a lot of deep processing. Um, so students aren't just receiving information um, from a worksheet or a lecture. Um, they're actually thinking about the concepts, thinking about the problems, uh, thinking about their own thinking and, and their learning. Um, they're using a lot of elaborative strategies, um, which means that they're not just putting down an answer, they're explaining and justifying their answers. And they're making models uh, and critiquing models um, and really working through every step of understanding the concept. Um, and there's significant meta metacognitive reflection. Um, so students, in order to be highly engaged, should be thinking about their own learning. Um, so in, if we're looking at how do we get students on this higher end of the engagement continuum, um, intentional learning uh, in an inquiry-based classroom is going to be your best bet. Uh, and while the students are learning, they're going to be asking themselves questions like, how do I learn? How do I think critically? Am I aware of existing misconceptions that I might have? Um, what would it take for me to change my mind? So they're thinking about their own thought processes. They're thinking about their learning. They're thinking about, you know, they're thinking conceptually. Um, on the other hand, if a student is on the lower end of the engagement continuum, uh, they're doing things like practicing rehearsal and mnemonics. So singing songs, making, um, you know, uh, just memorizing facts. Um, they're using very simple strategies and they're not really reflecting on their own learning. Um, so I know that a lot of us uh, older uh, teachers may have actually experienced this kind of learning ourselves in school um, where we got a lot of lecture, a lot of worksheets, um, a lot of memorizing the study guide before the test and then forgetting everything afterward. Um, so we want to be practicing uh, activities in the classroom with students that allow them to really engage their brain um, while they're learning. Um, so in the National Center for Science Education's curriculum, um, we really try and get students to develop their own understanding through investigation and consensus building. Um, so talking with their teachers, talking with classmates, um, really trying to build an understanding conceptually uh, for, for what they're learning about. Um, we try and get students to create and revise models of their understanding to show their thinking um, and then critique the thinking of their classmates. And we try and get them to analyze authentic data and form conclusions as much as possible. Um, so we want them engaging with real evidence from real scientists or engaging in simulations and activities uh, that are modeled on authentic science. Um, so what can we do if a student is not on the high level of the engagement continuum or is not engaging at all with the messaging and materials that the teacher is presenting? Um, so this is, uh, in order to, to do this, um, we have something that's called a peripheral cue. Um, so a peripheral cue is when teachers bring in any outside speaker um, who the student might trust uh, and identify with 
um, that's going to back up the teacher's messaging. So these outside speakers could be um, any trusted professionals like farmers, doctors, engineers, scientists, meteorologists. Um, it could also be people in the school building, like another teacher, an administrator. Um, it could be clergy members. It could be vetted social media influencers, um, like the Amoeba Sisters or Hank Green, or someone that uh, the students really find engaging and trustworthy. Um, so if we get students these role models who are saying the same thing and demonstrating the same concepts as the teacher, this might be enough to get students engaged. Well, if this person's saying it, maybe I'll actually consider it. Um, and I know that, that doesn't make us feel great as teachers, um, that sometimes we need a little extra help or a little nudge from someone outside of our classroom. But this can be very, very effective. So this is why programs like Skype a Scientist can be so effective as if used in the classroom. You know, giving those students a role model. This person is a scientist who is studying this thing. Let's hear from them directly. Let's see what their work is like. Let's see what kind of evidence they can present. Um, and this is also why things like March Mammal Madness um, are really exciting and engaging for students because they get to see experts in their field having fun while learning. Um, so again, there's lots of evidence uh, that shows that people respond better to role models who do not find conflict between things like science and religion or science and politics um, or role models who have uh, stories of themselves holding misconceptions and then resolving those misconceptions when presented with evidence. Um, so there are lots of different examples that can be given, um, but what a teacher would want to do is find someone who, um, you know, can appropriately demonstrate what they are trying to get across to their students. So if their students are having uh, problems, um, kind of consolidating their religious beliefs with, you know, their scientific understanding of a topic, we can find a role model in that arena. Um, if they're having trouble uh, kind of making their, their or their parents' political um, ideations fit with understanding climate change, we can find someone who would demonstrate and be a good role model in that area. Um, so really looking around, asking local professionals, local experts, um, reaching out to universities, um, you know, signing up for Skype a scientist, all of these things can provide a peripheral cue that may move students onto the engagement continuum or move them to a higher level of the engagement continuum so that they can really thoughtfully and open-mindedly think about the message that's being presented to them, think about how they're incorporating it um, and resolving their misconceptions. Um, so, to kind of summarize, we, we've looked at all of the parts of, of this cognitive reconstruction of knowledge model. Um, so we've learned that resolving misconceptions with students can be very complex. So we have to start with first understanding the student and understanding what misconceptions they might have, um, learning about how to engage students um, in becoming motivated to even accepting or listening to um, a new idea. We have to design a clear, coherent, plausible message for them to learn about that concept. And we have to get them engaged in a high level with the information that we're presenting. Um, so if we don't have motivated students or a clear and coherent message, and we don't provide a peripheral cue, uh, research shows that there will be no conceptual change, which means that the student is not going to resolve that misconception, and that misconception is going to be how they understand that topic uh, in the long term. If we have students uh, that are motivated, and we have a clear, coherent, plausible message, uh, and they're engaged on the low end of the engagement continuum, lecturing, doing worksheets, um, practicing simple mnemonics, there will either be no conceptual change or weak conceptual change, which means that a student might 
uh, temporarily put aside their misconception, but then eventually go back to it. Um, and then the, the final thing, the thing that we're hoping for is if we have a motivated student uh, who wants to reevaluate the conception that they have, we have a clear, concise, coherent, plausible message, and we have students that are highly engaged with the material that we're presenting, um, then and only then can we see strong conceptual change, which means that we'll have students that permanently resolve their misconception and move to a more solid scientific understanding of the concept. Uh, but research also shows that there's always a possibility that we can do everything right and students still will not resolve their misconceptions. Um, so all we can do is try. We can try and motivate the student. We can try and create a clear, cohesive message. We can try and engage them at a high level. And then and only then might we see a student permanently resolve their misconception. Um, so uh, to summarize, what does it take to produce strong conceptual change? We need a well-formed message that an individual can engage in, um, that is rhetorically compelling, that is coherent, and that is comprehensible. Uh, and we need to get them motivated to interact with that message at a high level on the engagement continuum. Uh, sounds easy, right? Um, so I know that this was, uh, a lot. Um, like I said, misconceptions can be very complex, um, but I hope that you've learned a few tools uh, that can help you learn about your students, learn about what they might be bringing into the classroom, uh, and think of some ways that you can present new information in a way that might get them engaged, reconsidering the concepts that they hold, uh, and coming to a better scientific understanding of those concepts.